Amen. Happy Father's Day 2023. I'm truly honored to uh, be given the Father's Day message today. And as I look around me and I just see so many incredible dads that are in the house today, um, there's so many of you that are probably more worthy to come up here and talk about Father's Day more than myself. I'm just truly honored that to be in the house of so many incredible dads and so many incredible dads that are watching online today. And then I look around as well and I see so many young men that are here today that are yet to be dads. And man, I can already tell that, that many of you are just going to be incredible dads that are going to raise incredible families and do incredible things for the kingdom of God. You know, and a lot of you uh, ladies and girls and Young men, or okay, Father's Day message, you're, I'm tuning him out and just letting him talk to the dads today. But uh, yes, I'm going to be talking to the dads a lot today. But there is also a part today that I want to talk to all of us about that one thing that all of us have in common is we all have the same Heavenly Father, right? So we're going to talk about that today. But you know, you're supposed to uh, give a sermon title. And the sermon title today is Being a Dad in 2023. You know, if you were, uh, I want to give you some, uh, a little bit of the origins on, of Father's Day before we start today, just in case you ever plan, plan Trivial Pursuit and uh, they ask you about Father's Day, you're, you're going to have some answers here today. But the origins of Father's Day started in 1909 by a lady by the name of Sonora Dodd, who is from the state of Washington. Uh, Sonora Dodd had a dad, and his, his name was William Smart. And William Smart was a Civil War uh, veteran. Well, he was widowed when his wife died giving birth to their sixth child. So he had to be a single parent to raise six kids. That's, wow. I can't even imagine how hard and challenging that that would be, but it was something that he did. And as his daughter, Sonora, began to raise her own family, she began to look back at the strength and the selflessness of her dad to do what he did to, to raise six kids on his own. So she wanted to commemorate not just him, but all dads, because she began to see her own husband, and what it took to be a good father. So she wanted to create a special day that would celebrate dads, and her original idea was to celebrate this, this celebration of dads on her dad's birthday, which is June the 5th. But like all of us, she got busy, and to put together this big celebration that she wanted to put, she couldn't get it together until June the 19th, which is the 3rd. Sunday of the month. And it caught on so much that it eventually even made it up to Washington. It made it to the Capitol as this celebration became bigger and bigger. And in 1924, President Calvin Coolidge, he liked the idea of celebrating a National Father's Day, but it didn't become official until 1966 when President Lyndon Johnson signed the presidential proclamation to celebrate Father's Day on the third Sunday, just in case you ever have that trivial pursuit question, it's always the third Sunday of every June, but it became permanent when President Nixon signed the congressional resolution to make Father's Day a national holiday. Do you feel more educated now this morning? You're dismissed. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. I was reading the other day about a man by the name of, of, of Perry Cohen, and this is not uh, necessarily a joke. It's, it's, it's a real story, and that Perry Cohen was having some health challenges and some health issues. And he went to his doctor, and they began to talk about his health issues. And the doctor was very, very concerned about what was happening with Perry's health. And he told Perry that if some changes weren't made, that within 30 days, that he would be dead. 
he told Perry, there are some things that I need you to do effective immediately. I need you to go home and talk to Debbie, your wife. Back in those days, they all kind of knew each other's family, you know. Uh, I want you to go home and I want you to talk to Debbie. And I want you to tell Debbie that she has to start making you more nutritional meals. The next thing that we need to do is that, is that you are stressed out about money. You're stressed out about finances. You need to set a budget and you need to tell Debbie that this is the budget that I've set in place and this is the budget that we need to follow. You also need to tell Debbie that when you come home from work at night, because you work so much, that she's got to keep the kids off of your back. As soon as you walk in the door, they're all over you. They're tugging for your attention throughout the evening. How many dads can say amen to that? They're struggling for you. They want your attention. You have to tell her to keep them off of your back and allow you to come home and rest. And lastly, you've got to quit working like a dog. If you don't stop working so hard, I'm telling you, if you don't make these changes that I just laid out for you, you will not be alive in 30 days. It says, Doc, that sounds all good coming from you, but it would sound a lot better if you were to call Debbie and you were to tell Debbie everything that I'm talking about rather than me. He calls Debbie and he tells her about the, the, the budget. He tells her about the nutritional changes that need to be made. He tells her that they need to keep the kids from jumping all over top of them and that her husband needs to slow down. And when he comes home from work that night, comes from visiting the doctor that day, Debbie runs to hug him and says, Honey, I'm sorry that you only have 30 days to live. And I think a lot of us dads can relate. Dads, even being moms, is kind of a thankless job, but the Bible does tell us to not be weary in, in well-doing. We have to keep on doing what we're doing in order for God to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in every single one of you dads here today for the kingdom of God. And I want to share a few passages of Scripture with you this morning regarding some roles of the dad, the roles of a father for their family. And one of the first roles is, is that the father is to be the leader of his family. Let's look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. It says, For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. Now, this is the angel of the Lord that had came to talk to Abraham and Sarah to talk to them about how Sarah was going to have a child. There were three men that were together that day. One of them we know for certain was an angel of the Lord. Some theologians believe all three were, were but we're not going to get into that today. But they begin to talk to uh, Abraham about what he is to do and that he is to command his children and his household after him and that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. A lot of times the word command gets a bad vibe because people can look at it and say the word command is open to abuse. However, God has placed a certain sense of position of responsibility for every man in his family. Even though we read in Scripture that Eve is the one that partook of the fruit, we also know that Adam was ultimately held responsible because we call it Adam's sin. God holds men responsible for the faithfulness to God for his family. And because God gives men this sense of responsibility, then he gives them the authority to command. And we read in Scripture in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 15, that that is exactly what Joshua did when he says this to the people, when he speaks this command. Let me read it to you. This is him speaking to the nation. He says, so fear the Lord 
and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols of your ancestors that your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today who you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors that served beyond the Euphrates, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? Here it is. But for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, he made a decision to serve the Lord regardless what was happening in his culture around him. And all of the men sitting here today and all of you who are watching online in our modern day culture of 2023 have a similar choice to make. In our cultural climate in which we now live, I think we can all agree that living for God and the principles of God and the ways of God can seem very counter culture. As in Joshua's time, we need men who I guess you could say should grow a spiritual backbone and begin to take a stand. And men who love their families and they want to make it clear that they are not going to follow the ways of culture in which they live, but rather they choose to live after the ways of the Lord God Almighty and the words that we see from the Lord in Scripture. There has never been a time more critical in our history than fathers and that, are, that get behind their families right now. We are at a fork in the road in our culture that we, we face chaos, we face confusion, we face lack of clarity. We have voices that are coming all around us from all different directions. Fathers of this modern generation, men of this modern generation are so critical for the well-beings of their culture and their families. We read in Scripture, and I'm not going to read it, but I encourage all of you, write down Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And go and read it in your own leisure, in your own time. Because we see in this passage of Scripture what happens when men are not leading their families. We begin to see in these passages of Scripture, from Isaiah chapter 3, we begin to see that children become rebellious. We begin to see women take on illegitimate authoritative roles. And we begin to see men become Weak, and we're beginning to see it happen today in our culture of 2023. Too many men are operating outside of the authority that God has given and spoken for us to have. And when we begin to go outside the realms and the ways of God, and we begin to wonder why is culture messed up? Why do things seem to be in disarray? When you begin to get outside the word of God and you begin to allow people to operate in realms that they were never called to operate, then we begin to see confusion. Then we begin to see things go in disarray. And that is why it's important that men begin to know the word of God so they can begin to operate in the ways that God has designed men to operate. In Joshua chapter 24 that we just read, Joshua declares, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Before, we, before he said that, what we read just a few verses up, he begins to talk to them about where they came from. He begins to talk to them about the, the, the worship of, 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 of how their, their grandfathers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and how they worshiped in the land of Egypt. And he tells them that you need to get away from that. Then he begins to talk to them about the cultural struggles that they were having right then and there. We often think, oftentimes think that we're the only culture that struggled with these kinds of things. 
Back in the Old Testament, thousands and thousands of years ago, they were having the same similar struggles and that their culture was affecting their families. It was affecting their men as they began to follow after the ways of culture rather than following after the ways of God. And Joshua leaned into it. And I'm asking you here this morning to lean into it as well because we do have multiple voices that aren't the voices of God. They're not the voices that come from Scripture that are telling us how we should feel, how we should live, how we should operate, how we should move, and the decisions that we need to make. But we need to join with Joshua here this morning and make the decision that we will not be defined by our culture, but rather we will be defined by the word and the principles and the ways of God, just as Joshua was warning them not to operate in the ways of culture. So here this morning, not Tim Oakley, but the Holy Spirit is challenging you men and you women here today not to operate with the ways of culture, but rather to step up and to operate according to the principles and the ways of God. Joshua's decision was a personal decision. And it's the same for all of you men who are listening and hear my voice this morning. It is your personal decision that you are going to line up with the word of God and say, but for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And when you do that, your family ought to know about it. Your friends ought to know about it. The people in your culture ought to know about it. Because when God begins to see you operate according to his ways and his will, then you will begin to see fresh and new blessings begin to happen in your life all around you. We are called to be leaders. And number two, we as fathers are to be instructors of our family. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. It says, honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So this is coming from the Ten Commandments. How many of you young people here today want things to go well with you? How many of you want to live a long life while you're here on the earth? Scripture tells us this is the only commandment that comes with a promise if we honor our parents, then we will, things will go well with you, and you will live a long life. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, and you fathers, so now he's talking to all of you dads here today, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and in the admonition of the Lord. It seems that we focus so much on that very first part of Scripture there. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. That's kind of where we live. That's where we kind of focus. You know, when our, when our, when our kids get upset with, oh, it's your, you know, you provoked your children to wrath. And God's Word says not to provoke your children to wrath. But it doesn't seem like we focus enough on that second part. To me, which is the most important part. Because if you do the, the next part, then the first part will fall into naturally as the Holy Spirit leads you. He says, but bring them up in the training and in the admonition of the Lord. We also read in Proverbs chapter 22, 6, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Now, this is a passage of Scripture that if kept many of you young fathers and you seasoned fathers to have many sleepless nights. Just because you have raised your children up in the ways of the Lord does not always mean that your children are immediately going to follow after how you have raised them to be. Some of the greatest, I mean the greatest heroes of the faith, 
the greatest heroes in the Bible had children who did not model after daddy, at least for not for quite some time. We have Samuel, who I, clear, who I think is one of the greatest prophets of the Bible. He had two really bad boys, and you can go read it on your own. We look, we look at uh, Eli, the priest, a great priest, a mighty man of God. He, too, had two boys in the church who were leaders in the temple who did not follow anything close after their dad. We see that David had Absalom. Abraham had Ishmael. Adam had Cain. Isaac had Esau. And Jacob, we had a bunch of boys that didn't exactly follow the right path. He only had one son who got it early on. The rest came along a little bit later, but he too struggled with it. But this principle that we read about here in Proverbs chapter 22, 6, direct your children into the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. If we teach our children about the Lord when they are younger, Scripture tells us that they are more than likely to come around when they get older. But we have to remember that just like us, our children have choices. They have the freedom of choice and they will not always make the right choice. There are some incredible dads that I see here in the building that I look at their lives and I want my, me to be a father just like them. But when I have gotten to know these fathers that I look up to and honor so much, I begin to see and find out that they didn't have real good beginnings that they too were raised in the faith, but there was a time in their life where they drifted very far from the faith because they aren't perfect. There's a movie that I love so much, and it's Rudy. If you've never watched the movie Rudy and you're a dude, you need to watch Rudy. But there's something that the, that, that the priest told Rudy in, in, in that movie that I totally agree with. And he told Rudy that there are after years and years of theological study, there are two unequivocal truths. And one is, is that, is that, uh, I'm sorry, is that the two things I know is that there is a God and I'm not him. All of you dads in the building, none of you are perfect. We all have our imperfections. And all of our children, they have their imperfections. But it's important that we continue to love them. And I think one of the greatest stories, and I'm not going to go through the entire story. I'm going to give a 30-second Cliff Notes version of the story. It's the story to me that's the perfect example of how much the Heavenly Father loves his children. And that's the story of the prodigal son. And this is a young man that said, Dad, I am sick and tired of your ways. I'm sick and tired of, of you telling me what I can and what I can't do. And I don't want my inheritance when you die. I want my inheritance now because I want to go ahead and start living my life my way. And surprisingly, the dad agreed. And the dad gave him his portion of the inheritance. And we learn later that his son, his good son, the son that followed after dad, told him that, that, that my brother, he's messing around with prostitutes. So the boy goes out on his own. And I guess you could say that he had a life of sex, drugs, rock and roll. He did it all. He partied hard. He boozed, and I'm sure he made all kinds of friends. But then one day, his money ran out. And when his money ran out, I'm sure that his friends didn't want to hang out with him too much because he probably couldn't buy them a lot of the things that, they were, that he wanted to buy them. He couldn't continue to keep up with the lifestyle that he was living. And Scripture tells us that he went to work for a pig farmer, and then he got to the point that he had no food and no money, that he began to eat the food that he was given to the pigs. And then he got to the point to said, you know what? I'm going to go back to my dad and I'm going to say, dad, I goofed up and I don't even want to be accepted back as your son. I just want to come and be one of your hired hands. I want to come and just be one of your employees. And then when he began to go back home, his dad saw him and his dad was overjoyed that his son had made the decision to come home and he threw a big celebration for him and welcomed him home and said, my son is not dead, he is alive again. He was lost, but now he has been found. 
this is a wonderful picture. It's a wonderful story of raising our own children. Even when your children are raised in a godly house, they will many times rebel. And I really feel as I was preparing for this, that the Lord was really speaking to my heart that there are a lot of dads here today who have estranged children, children that you don't no longer have a close relationship with because they've went a different direction than you. There's been arguments. There's been strong words that have been said between the two of you. But I want to encourage all of you here today, all of you dads that may be dealing with this same situation, don't give up on the children. Keep loving your children. The dad that we read about of the prodigal son left the door open for his son to come back home. And if our kids can't come back home, then where else can they go? Because I think we can all agree this world can't give them what God can give them. And nobody loves them more than their parents. So keep the door open for your parents. And again, I want to encourage you, don't stop praying for them. You may be the only person in their life that is bringing their name before the very throne room of God as you pray for them, as you intercede for them, as you lift them up before the throne of God. Keep praying for your children. And this is a wonderful, again, example of the Heavenly Father and how much he loves us that none of you here, none of you watching online today have went too far. I've went too far. You have no idea who I am, Tim. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the things that I've said, and you don't know the places I've been. I'm here today, today to tell you that God knows everything about you, and he opens the door for you to come back, and he will celebrate at your return. Amen. I think that we all can agree, those of us who are parents, that you can't even articulate how much you love your children. When you have a child, there is a sense of love for them that is almost unexplainable, that you would literally take a bullet for your child. You will do anything for them. And I want you to know that that is something that God has given to us because we are the children of God. He is the ultimate heavenly father. And as much as we love our children real big, so our heavenly father here this morning loves every single one of you in the house, every single one of you watching online. God loves you big and as we want nothing best, be better more than our children to do well, our Heavenly Father wants nothing more than for us to do well and to bless us. And I also know that there are a lot of you dads here that you probably maybe don't get the thank you, Dad, for being who you are. Thank you for all that you do for me as much as you probably should. But man, I know for sure that if the Lord were to sit next to you today, he would put his arms around you and tell you, dads, I am well pleased in you. Keep doing what you're doing. I love you. I'm proud of you. So I want you dads to know today, those of you who just feel empty, that don't feel that you're getting the love that you need, keep, don't get weary and well doing. Keep doing what you're doing because the Lord wants you to know that he's proud of you today and that he loves you. I want to read two final passages of Scripture today that talks to us about the perfection of having the Heavenly Father as our dad. We see here in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, it says, And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. You are the clay. You are the potter. We were formed by your hand. Psalm 68, 5 tells us that he is the father to the fatherless. He is the defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. I'm certain of all the people that are here this morning that there are many that never felt 
the love and the support and having the ideal experience of what a father should be for a family. Many of you may even have a hard time associating father and love in the same exact sentence. There are many who have had their fathers abandon them. There are many here today that their dads have went on and is now with the Lord. But I do want to share with you this morning some good news and that all of us have God who is the ultimate father and he is perfect. All of us here this morning come from different backgrounds. We come from different places. We may be different colors, but the one thing that we all have in common is that we all share the same heavenly father. And he loves and he cares for every single one of you. And we talked earlier about how we are all imperfect. Well, he is perfect. I was reading a story from, that Tony Evans wrote the other day about a little boy that was on an airplane. And the airplane was having a really rough go at it. The plane was moving up. It was moving down. It was going from side to side. It looked like they potentially weren't going to make it. The, the plane was in peril. And there was an older lady and a young boy who were sitting side by side during all of this, when all of this is going on in the plane. The lady's in, in, in terror. She's scared for her life. But the little boy is playing with, with, a, with a toy car. And he's got a little doll that he's just playing with. And he's just having fun. And he's just laughing during all of this. And the lady finally gets tired of it, and she says, young man, do you not realize what's going on in this plane? You need to quit being happy. You need to quit, being, you need to quit playing, and you need to get serious. And he looked at the lady. He put his hand on her leg, and he says, ma'am, my daddy's the pilot. We're going to be okay. And I want to remind all of you here this morning that God the Father is your pilot. And everything is going to be okay. How many of you remember when you were a kid growing up and you got afraid and you ran to daddy to protect you, for dad to step up and to protect you from, from what you were afraid of? That's what you call childlike faith. That's why scripture talks so much about childlike faith because when we were a child, we believed that daddy had our back that daddy was not going to let anything bad happen to us, that he was going to make the boogeyman go away, or that he was going to protect us from whatever it was that we were afraid of, be it a bug or a lizard, whatever it, it may be. And God wants to remind all of you here today that he is here to protect you. No matter what you're going through in life, get behind the heavenly father because he has the answer to all things. I've been reading so much scripture lately where God has just been showing me that, 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 that mankind does not have the answers. Culture does not have the answers. God is the one who has the answers. And I want to encourage all of us here today, get behind the heavenly father. He has all of the answers. He can protect you and he will see you through. I don't know how many times Jesus said peace, but he said it so many times to the disciples. He spoke to them about peace. And I just want all of you here today to have peace in a world that's full of turbulence, that you would experience peace. And all of you dads that are in the building this morning, when you begin to realize who God is and you make him your heavenly father and you make him your leader, then you bring peace to your family because you experience his peace. And when your family is stressed out to the max, when they're worried, they see that you're not worried. They see that you have the peace of God because you know who God is for he is the ultimate father. Amen. As our praise and worship team comes and concludes today, I just want to say a prayer for all of us. If you all want to close your eyes and bow your heads, if you would, Father, just pray blessings upon every single person that is here today, Lord. I pray that you would love on every single person that is here today as the ultimate heavenly father. I pray for those that maybe it's been a long time 
since they have felt your embrace, since they have felt your love, since they have felt the peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray, Father God, that you would just love on some people today as we celebrate Father's Day, Lord. I pray that we would experience the love of the Heavenly Father, the pure love of the Heavenly Father, the peace that surpasses understanding that comes from the Heavenly Father. I pray you would minister to every single person here today, and I pray that you would embolden all of the dads. I pray that you would let them know how much you care for them, how much you love for them, and how well they're doing, and let them know that you'll never leave them and that you'll never forsake them. And Lord, if there be anyone that's hissing to this message today that has never said, Lord, come into my life. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I pray, Lord God, that decisions are being made right now and that at this moment people begin to ask you to come into their lives and to lead and direct them for all that they do and that they would ask that you would forgive them of their sins and they would literally feel freshness like they've never felt before. I'm going to come back up and do a final prayer. We'll let the praise and worship team minister to us in one more song. You can all stand, please.